A woman collapses during a hike in the Alaskan wilderness and is pronounced dead. However, during her funeral, a wild wolf breaks through the throng of mourners by the graveside and refuses to leave her side. Then a doctor takes a closer look at the body and immediately calls the cops. Minette wasn't hiking her usual trail. A landslide had forced a detour. She was higher into the hills than usual and on a path that was less worn. Something metallic glinted and then snagged her boot. Minette frowned. Litter sometimes marred the Alaskan outdoors. It instantly frayed her temper. Careless campers and hikers leaving behind more than footprints spoiled the wilderness for everyone. She crouched and her frown instantly deepened. This was not a carelessly discarded piece of trash. Someone had left several tangles of electric wire behind. Several of these odd bundles of cord were strewn about. It would be impossible to collect them all and carry them off the mountainside. Not by herself, anyway. Then, Minette heard something from behind a rocky outcrop. Initially, it sounded like a whining dog, but as she followed the sound, she could hear it was something different. When she came around the outcrop, she staggered back. There, caught in another of the rolls of electric wire, was a fully grown wolf. This was not the hulking monstrosity of campfire tales and local mythology. It was an animal with startlingly intelligent eyes. They were amber and burned with a mixture of pain and fury and they fixed on her, watching her every move. Minette stood dead still. The wolf's right front leg was entangled in the wire mess. The animal thrashed and pulled, and with each movement, the wire cut deeper. Blood seeped from the wound on its leg. Every few seconds, the wolf rested. Then it resumed its struggle for freedom with a desperate lunge. Minette's heart thumped. She'd heard stories. Wolves would chew their own legs off to escape a trap. She was scared, but at the same time, she feared for the wolf's survival. If she didn't intervene, it was almost certain the creature would die. Every survival instinct nagged Minette to get out of there and find someone with a rifle, but she decided to do the opposite. Still, the wolf's eyes didn't leave her for a split second. This was not aggression or even simple animal terror. There was a flicker of hope in those eyes, woven in with the animal's absolute fury at being contained. The animal snarled and bit at its leg. Minette fumbled for her backpack. She slid it off her shoulders and opened it. Every movement was calculated and tiny. There was bear spray, but she wasn't going to be using that. She was after a battered tin of salmon. It was a risky gamble, but perhaps the animal's hunger would outweigh its fury. She found the tin and peeled back the top. The stink of stale fish and rich oil filled the atmosphere around her and the wolf. Minette moved even slower now. No sudden gestures. She knelt just outside of the wolf's lunge range. Then she extended a hand with the can of salmon. The wolf's nostrils flared. A low growl rose from deep in its throat, but it didn't attack. The animal looked at her, then at the fish, and then back at her. The growl died down. A bead of sweat trickled down Minette's back. The trap. There had to be a way. She had a pocket knife. It wasn't ideal, but it would have to do. She moved closer to the animal. Then she reached out. The wolf wasn't looking at her hand. It was holding her gaze. Finally, she felt fur beneath her fingertips. So far, so good. Slowly, she worked her fingers under the wire. When there was enough space, she slid the blade of the pocket knife in and started sawing through the cord. The wolf yelped, but it didn't snarl. It was as if the animal was accepting that she was there to help. She gained an inch, then another. The wire was loosening, just a little more. Then the electrical cable snapped. The wolf was free. It stumbled backward and so did Minette. The animal gave her a last fleeting look and disappeared back into the green heart of the forest. There was silence around Minette now. The only sound was her own ragged breathing. The wire had cut her hands. When she looked down at them, they were trembling fiercely. This might be the stupidest thing she'd ever done, she thought. A wild animal, wounded and cornered, she could thank her lucky stars. It could have turned out a lot worse. The salmon tin was still clutched in her fist. Minette backed away slowly. There was no point in following the wolf. Whatever desperation drove it to tolerate her presence was gone now. At the trailhead, she paused. Her hands were shaking so badly that she could barely work the zipper of her jacket. The smart thing would be to head straight back to town, report the bundles of electrical cords, and get the conservation officers on it before another animal falls victim. 
but in her mind's eye, she saw the raw flesh of the wolf's wound. It was injured, maybe badly, and every day it went without food, infection would fester more. The following day, Manette took the same route again. She paused to catch her breath uh, close to the spot where she'd helped the wolf the day before. She settled against a moss-covered rock and pulled out the hastily assembled package from her backpack. There was leftover chicken and a handful of corned beef. The first hour was silent except for the rustle of wind and the birds. Just as impatience started to gnaw at Manette, a twig snapped behind her. She whirled. Her heart pounded, but it was just a squirrel twitching its tail with indignation. Then a noise from her left. She held her breath. A shadow moved behind a cluster of furs. It was the wolf. The animal was limping slightly and looked even thinner than she remembered. Its fur stood up in ragged clumps. Yet its posture wasn't aggressive. Minette laid the package of food on the ground, then retreated slowly, putting a good 20 feet between herself and her offering. The wolf didn't move at first, then hesitantly it limped forward. It sniffed the package, looked warily in her direction, and took another step. Then another. Jaws opened and the food disappeared in a few ravenous gulps. That was day one. For two weeks, Minette came every day. She hauled daily food packages up the mountain to ensure the wolf had every opportunity to heal properly. She always came alone, always unarmed, and always with a carefully wrapped offering scavenged from her modest pantry. And always the wolf met her with that wary yet hopeful stillness. Those amber eyes followed her every move. Then came the morning Minette didn't arrive. The wolf knew something was amiss the moment it reached the clearing. There was no faint scent of the human, no rustle hinting at her carefully silent approach. It waited. Minutes stretched into an hour. The sun rose higher, still no human. In the wolf, unease lived alongside hunger. Its nostrils flared, searching for a scent that didn't come. As dusk settled, the wolf knew it couldn't stay. Hunger demanded a hunt. Yet the urge to remain, just in case, battled it to a standstill. Finally, with a low, frustrated whine, it turned from the clearing and limped into the woods, searching for easier prey. On the way down the mountain the day before, Manette's chest had been acting up again. It wasn't a sharp pain, more a dull, heavy pressure, like a fist slowly squeezing her lungs. It was worse when she exerted herself. Even her usual morning hikes had become trials lately, yet some stubborn part of her refused to admit defeat. To see a doctor meant confirming something was wrong. That scared her more than the shortness of breath. She was almost down the mountainside. Just one more bend in the familiar trail, she thought. She kept the pace slow, deliberately filling her lungs and ignoring the way her skin grew clammy with sweat. It was only when the forest path finally opened onto the edge of town that something shifted. Not a worsening of the pain, but a sudden, disorienting lightness. As if gravity itself had loosened its grip, Minette stumbled and clutched at a tree for support. The ground tilted beneath her. It wasn't the chest pain anymore, it was something much, much worse. She had a sense of her own body becoming insubstantial. Then, with a soft sigh that barely ruffled the leaves, Manette collapsed. An old farmer with a sprawling acreage bordering the trail found her hours later. He scrambled for his phone, but by then it was too late. The paramedics were locals hardened by the harsh realities of Alaskan life. They found no pulse, and there was no flicker of life in those wide-open eyes. They declared her dead. Word spread quickly into town the size of Haven Creek. This time, it wasn't the vicious buzz of gossip. Minette had few close friends. There was no family to speak of, but she was known as the solitary woman choosing the edge of the wilderness over a cozy house in the center of things. The funeral was a small one. No wailing relatives, no outpouring of belated affection, just the somber faces of townsfolk paying their respects. The preacher was a kindly man with weathered hands. He struggled to find words for a life cut short with so little warning. Midway through his sermon, all hell broke loose. A low growl echoed from the back of the circle of mourners at the graveside. Heads whipped around. A murmur of alarm rippled through the mourners. Someone's dog slipped its leash? But this growl was deeper, wilder, edged with a desperate fury. And then they saw it. A fully grown wolf. Its eyes burned with a light that was neither fear nor aggression. Some shouted warnings. There was a scrape of chairs pushed back. But the wolf ignored them. Its gaze was fixed on the plain wooden coffin at the open grave. It bounded through the crowd with a singular focus. 
when it reached the coffin, the wolf reared up, its paws braced against the cheap wood. There was a collective gasp from the mourners. Was this animal about to desecrate the body? But then, in a motion shockingly gentle for such a creature, it pressed its nose against the lid. A soft whimper escaped its throat. The mourners erupted in an explosion of noise. Screams cut through the startled silence. Some fainted, others stumbled back. Their eyes were wide with a mix of horror and disbelief. Get it off her, someone shouted. Get that monster away. Instinct took over. Two figures lunged forward. Joe was the owner of the bait shop. He was hefty and normally good-natured. He now brandished the folding chair he'd been sitting on. Pastor Michael fumbled for the cross at his throat. Their intentions were clear. Protect the body and drive the beast away. But the wolf was faster. Not with simple animal speed, but with the focused fury of a creature defending its own. With a snarl that shook the mourners to their core, it launched itself at the coffin. Wood splintered as it landed. The sudden weight toppled the flimsy stand. The coffin tilted, then crashed to the floor. The lid wrenched free, and the body toppled out. Minette's face was a bloodless, white mask. Her eyes were closed in eternal sleep. Then the unthinkable happened. Her chest moved. It was a shallow but unmistakable rise and fall. Someone stumbled past the wolf, ignoring its defensive snarls. It was the local doctor. Her hands were surprisingly steady. She tilted Minette's head and felt for a pulse. Then she paled and shouted a string of hurried directions at whoever was close by. Call 911, get blankets, and careful, her leg might be broken from the fall, and get the police here now. The wolf was abruptly forgotten, but it wasn't about to be controlled. With a final snarl at the humans pressing in, it turned and bounded back toward the woods. Minette was now the center of a whirlwind. The doctor, normally easygoing, barked orders like a seasoned sergeant major. Pastor Michael fumbled for his phone. Even Joe from the bait shop lowered his chair. His face was now a mask of slack-jawed confusion. Chaos still reigned, but now a different kind. Not terror, but a frantic, disbelieving hope. Pastor Michael found his voice. Move the benches aside, he said. Clear a space. Lord have mercy. The local ambulance crew was more used to snowmobile accidents than medical miracles. The doctor's hasty diagnosis was confirmed. Minette was alive, barely, and in critical condition. Each jolt of the rough ride to the nearest hospital threatened to undo what fragile spark of life flickered in her. Much later, when the ordeal had blurred into a haze of sterile rooms and worried faces, the doctor would be the first to ask the question on everyone's minds. How? And Joe, the rough outdoorsman not known for sentimentality, would find himself uncharacteristically blurting out what everyone was thinking. That wolf knew she was alive. The first days were a blur. Ironically, it was not of darkness, but the relentless white brightness that made Minette nauseous. A sterile smell clung to the starched sheets. The constant buzz of monitors underscored the sluggish beats of her heart. She came to gradually. First, there was an awareness of pain. It wasn't the dull ache of her chest, though. Her leg hurt. It had twisted awkwardly in the fall from the coffin. A nurse smiled a weary smile and said, Good, you're feeling that. Just a fracture, luckily. Around her, the doctors spoke in lowered voices. Minette couldn't quite make out what they were saying, but she picked up words like remarkable recovery, unusual presentation, and full neurological workup. The doctor finally spelled it out. Catalepsy, she said. She rolled the unfamiliar word over her tongue. It's rare, extremely so. Mimics all the outward signs of death, crucially, and the important bits keep ticking over, even if they do so mighty slowly. Minette stared at her. The word failed to register. Had there been a misdiagnosis? Some mistake in the frantic aftermath at the church? The doctor shook her head. She told Minette multiple tests confirmed it, and that it was the only explanation that made sense. During the episode and thereafter, her heart kept on going, but it was beating so slowly that nobody picked it up. She also told Minette that they had no idea what her collapse had been all about, but they were running tests to figure that out. Next came the reporters. At first, it was the local paper, then something bigger from Anchorage, maybe even national news. She was dubbed Miracle Woman of the Wilderness, and the papers and television broadcasters ran with her story like she'd won the presidential election. Minette refused interviews, hiding beneath the scratchy hospital blanket, but the story took on a life of its own. The folks in Haven Creek were already shaken by the events at the church. Now they had a genuine legend in their midst. Minette the Solitary, Minette the Eccentric, was now Minette the Miraculous. 
They meant it kindly. Baked casseroles appeared on her doorstep. Kids peered over her fence with wide, curious eyes. She felt trapped, like a specimen under glass. It was one of those stiflingly normal days with the casserole fumes lingering in her small cabin that a new thought pierced the fog. The wolf. All the talk of miracles had been about her. But what about the creature who had refused to accept her death? It had disappeared back into the woods after the incident at the cemetery. There were rumors of sightings. Someone spotted paw prints too big to be any local dog. But that was all. Once Minette was on her feet, she found herself walking the familiar trails again. Not the distant path where she'd collapsed, but the route she'd taken for years. You found me back then, she whispered to herself. The words felt foolish when spoken aloud to the empty forest. Can you do it again? There was no answer, just the mournful call of a raven and the breeze stirring the trees. No flash of gray, fur, no unsettling gleam of amber eyes. The world seemed to have gone back to normal. The echoes of the impossible had been left behind. Eventually, she turned to head home, then paused. A faint sound, barely audible, a whimper from somewhere behind her. With a mix of trepidation and a strange, desperate hope, she retraced her steps. And there, half hidden by a tangle of fallen branches, was a creature both familiar and heartbreakingly changed. The wolf was thinner than ever. Its ribs were stark beneath its patchy fur. Its injured leg now dragged limply. It watched Bennett approach with none of the prior wariness. She knew with a certainty that defied logic that it had been waiting for her. No one understood. Not the doctor with her medical books. Not the reporters. Hungry for a tidy explanation to slap on a headline. Nobody could grasp why the wolf had sensed her life when seasoned professionals failed, or how it found her again in its weakened state, but that didn't matter to Minette. A few days later, Minette had managed to convince a wildlife vet to take the wolf under his care, and when it was well again, the wolf that saved her life became a fixture in her small cabin. The townsfolk got used to the sight. Sometimes he vanished into the woods for days, and then he returned with the scent of fresh prey and wildness in his eyes that always softened upon seeing her. Other times, he'd sit by her worn armchair as she read. Some in the village called Minette a saint. They whispered of a mystical connection between woman and beast. But she just shrugged. She didn't need them to understand. The bond she shared with the wolf was strong enough to exist without words. Late one night, as rain lashed at the window panes and the wolf lay splayed in front of the flickering fire, the questions that had haunted her finally faded from her thoughts. Was it animal instinct? A sense of smell keener than a doctor's stethoscope? Or some deeper connection? A debt repaid across the invisible boundary between species? It didn't matter. Looking at the creature whose fierce loyalty had saved her life, a simple truth settled in her heart. This was her family now. Unconventional, maybe even a bit miraculous, but undeniable. We may never fully understand the connection between humans and the natural world. Do you have a story of a unique bond between a wild animal and a human being? Tell us in the comments, we'd love to hear. For now though, we're out of here. Catch you in the next video.